All right, guys, here we are. You've heard me talk about these folks many, many times. I'm here with RFA, here with Jern. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, just uh, we're going to talk real briefly about, you know, what you're doing. You know, we've talked about your, your company in the past, but it was some time ago. And so we'd really like to get an update on how things are going with you now. Okay, it's pretty cool. So the engine is working, we're approaching stage level test, and by end of next year, hopefully we're going to see our first flight. Fantastic. Well, let's uh, have a seat and talk. Hello, YouTube. I'm the Angry Astronaut, and this is... All right, so since the last time that we spoke, I think you guys have made a lot of, of leaps and bounds and advances recently. So tell us a little bit more about where RFA is now compared to where you were a year ago. So the engine has been working. We had an engine test campaign over summer where we had 74 seconds demonstrated in several reignitions. Um, the full vehicle is lying in the facility structurally, so we are putting the stages together now and approaching the stage level testing. Um, second stage tank is about to ship in early October, so we're going to proceed with this test campaign very, very soon. So it's getting really exciting. So you, you think, at least you, you feel cautiously optimistic that you'll be able to do your first test flight at the end of 2023? Exactly. So assuming that all the stage level testing will now run to our, let's say, perception and uh, successfully, then this is definitely within reach, yes. So tell me, I mean, we've seen an explosion lately of European launch providers. I mean, we have several now in the UK. We have at least a couple, yourselves and ESAR here in, in, in Germany, also High Impulse, I guess, as well. And we have some in Spain. Why, in your opinion, do we have this sudden explosion of European launch providers? I think for now there's a shortage of launch in Europe, right? And after Soyuz is not flying anymore of Kourou, there's a transition between Ariane 5 and Ariane 6. Vega is still flying, but not a very high cadence. And we said there's really a strong need for launch systems right now. And that for a lot of startups, which believe rocketry is getting much more simple, offers a big opportunity to step in. That's why I think it's growing so much in numbers. So space is exploding. It's, yes, there are many satellite uh, manufacturers here, obviously. I've interviewed some of them actually in Britain. And yeah, the difficulty, I mean, for one thing, of shipping a satellite over the Atlantic, I've been told that the carbon footprint necessary to do that is actually greater than the carbon footprint to launch the rocket. Is that the case? Yeah, actually, it's a quite a nice comparison. I agree, yes. So yeah, it's, it's obvious. Um, where are you going to be launching from? Um, our main launch, the so first flight, will be from the UK in Saxa Ford and the Shetland Islands. So we believe they're putting up a very competitive site commercially over there. And in the long run, definitely we want to be in Kourou for lower inclination and the institutional launches that we're going to do. We need a pet there as well. So you run off of, um, off of uh, oxygen and methane, similar to how SpaceX does things. Um, uh, tell me about your engines and uh, how do they have an advantage over older engines or other types of engines on the market? So it's a LOX kerosene engine and it's a stage combustion engine in the first place. So essentially the holy grail of what you want to achieve in propulsion. This is a stage combustion, uses the exhaust from the pump and feeds it into the main combustion process and with such you achieve much higher efficiency and on the same scale op compared to an open cycle engine you achieve 30% more payload performance to orbit and that obviously gives us a great competitive pricing advantage to our direct competitors. Right so stage combustion obviously a big big advantage there. Have you found that to be a real challenge in development because stage combustion is something that a lot of people have attempted and failed so how, how have you been successful? So it's a challenge, I can definitely agree to that. And there's a lot of material publicly available um, that actually can help you. Uh, there's a couple of people in the world who sell stage combustion engines, and uh, these nations which they are sold to put a lot of test data out there on the web. And we said it's, you can actually draw conclusions from how these designs need to have been working. And we said we put together a pretty nice team that managed to develop this within four years time frame. So your payload is very impressive compared to, you know, a lot of the other smaller launch providers out there. I mean, it's about quadruple what the Electron is. Um, what, you know, inspired you to go bigger? You know, did you see a need for that? I mean, obviously, you're not as big as a Falcon 9 or anything, but still pretty big. So, you know, what, what made you think we need to have more, more payload? So it's 1.3 tons to a 500 kilometer SSO. 
And we believe that the one-ton spot is um, a good place to be. And that's for two reasons. On the one hand side, um, small launch systems, they have fixed costs. So they will be, it will be very difficult for them to sell cheaper than we are. For us, it's 5 million for a 1.3 ton launch. If you go to smaller vehicles, it will be very difficult to compete with that absolute price point. And at the same time, we can, with that size, already compete with rideshare emissions on bigger systems. So what we are offering and pricing on rideshare is the same than SpaceX on the Falcon 9 is offering on the transport emissions. And with that, we are really in that sweet spot of scale where we can compete on pricing with bigger vehicles. And at the same time, the lower ones will not be cheaper on dedicated launch. Okay, please repeat that. How much again for 1.3 tons? It's entry ticket 5 million euros. That, I, that blows my mind. I mean, you, you guys can't see my expression right now, but I'm astonished. I mean, because that's similar to what Rocket Lab charges for 300 kilos. How are you doing this? So it's actually, we decided since four years on technologies that will make this super cheap. We use stainless steel on the core stage tanks. We lose a lot of automotive supply chain components that we just built into the launch system, not qualifying anything specifically for space, but just making use of what is there. In southern Germany, where our facility is, there are four big automotive OEMs, BMW, Audi, Porsche, Mercedes, and they have a huge supply chain in that area that we can leverage. And with that, we get a very good quality at very cheap pricing that will have, hopefully, that benefit for the customer. Okay, so we, we have an, another company out there that is kind of using the sort of off-the-shelf solution or, in order to reduce cost, and that's Astra. They've really struggled in most of their launches lately. Um, what are you guys doing to see to it that you don't encounter some of the same technical problems that they've run into? It's a level of quality that you get from the suppliers. It's one point for us. So in, in Germany, you have uh, certifications and quality in these supply chains built in and still they manufacture and provide it cheap to you. But at, they ensure the quality, essentially. We have then on the supply chain on our side to manage incoming inspection and the full test program towards vehicle integration that we can certify, yes, all of what we purchased in here is fit for purpose for our first launch. Wow. Um, th again, this is very exciting. So, so you would say then, you know, and I'm, once again, I'm naming names here, but ESAR is also looking for a similar payload, but they're doing things differently. I think they're doing mostly in-house, building their own stuff, etc. So do you think you'll be able to come in at a much better price point than them as a result of that? Yeah, so what we find in the direct competition that we've been benchmarking, so with ISR, Firefly, Relativity, ABL, we are affected two to three cheaper than our direct competitors on dedicated launch. And that's really where we want to be. This is what we want to offer to our customers, that if you want to get something into space, RFA is the number one cheap provider to go to to put you reliably there. It's amazing. Um, so Saxavord, I've spoken a lot about them on my channel as well. What made Saxavord attractive to RFA? I think mainly what's behind it is that four people, commercially experienced, and they decided to buy a piece of land and build a spaceport. There's no state organization behind that, but just a venture like we are. And that makes exchange, speed of working, and mentality very much aligned is what we appreciate a lot, and which is why I believe they can really be fast on the timeline that we need to get a first launch. Wow. <clears throat> so Saxavord is talking about... Uh, launch cadence from their facility of 30 per year. Um, so what kind of cadence, I mean, once you guys really get up and running, what sort of cadence is your ambition? Our dream would be to get to a weekly launch cadence. Initially, we will do monthly, so 12 a year, and the delta in between will just be decided by the market. Yeah? Will it really evolve like everyone sees it right now? Will it collapse somewhat? We will stay with 12, we will, we will grow. It really depends on how this evolves. And for us, it's simple because we use so many parts out of supply chain. We don't have a big vertical integration manufacturing on our end, but we are mainly integrating what we buy out of the market. And that is much easier to scale. If you buy 50 instead of 10 out of a production quantity of a million a year in automotive industry, it's not an issue for these guys. So I had an opportunity recently to uh, speak to Space Forge uh, in the United Kingdom in depth, um, and their ambitions are are pretty aggressive too in terms of what <clears throat> the long term needs are going to be uh, for in in Leo. I mean, in terms of manufacturing uh, ma unique materials um, in microgravity, 3D printing organs in in microgravity, and they're saying, you know, what he told me is that they're not going to have enough launch providers to, ac to accommodate that. So do you foresee that possibility as well, that there's just going to be a huge demand once it's proven? 
I certainly agree to the trend that every exhibition like here that happens or every study which is coming out, there are new applications of what can be done in space. Being it on manufacturing side, as you just said, or with data coming from space, new products, new end customers, insurance, whatever, farmers behind that, that uh, and, uh, discover space and the data from it for their personal use case. So which is why there will be a super big push on that market and it will evolve. If it will need 200 small launch systems around the world that we see, I'm not so confident. It will, a few will remain, but not all of them. Can you tell me a little bit about your funding? Um, who, are, and once again, this, this may be confidential, but who is supporting RFA right now? Are you getting support from ESA and such, or is it mostly private investors? It's mainly private investment, so OHB, out of Bremen, the biggest satellite manufacturer in Germany, top three in Europe, they are behind this as a strategic investor, and they pushed, helped us from the beginning, and they are fully committed to pull this to the end. Um, they're looking for partners, so if someone is interested, they're, they're ready to talk, and at the same time, um, we have very strong support by the government as well. DLR, out of a competition, purchase payloads on our first two test flights, so this is actually a lot of risk mitigation they do for customers offering now these spots for free. An institutional payload, so and it helps us big deal that we will already demonstrate payload flights on the first two missions. That means transition to commercial business will be much easier for us. Wow! So the largest satellite manufacturer in Europe backing you up financially um, from beginning to end. That's that's a big plus. Obviously, you, you you need that kind of support in order to accomplish this. So, um, tell me, what sort of pitfalls do you anticipate in the future? I mean. You know, obviously space is hard. You know, we all know that. We, you know, we've seen, um, you know, right now we've seen some of the small launch providers out there struggle. You know, it's not just Astra. There are others as well. Um, so what do you anticipate and, and what plans do you have to overcome those pitfalls? Not sure. For us, it's uh, getting really exciting. So the full vehicle is lying in the facility and we now need to get through these stage level tests, which, uh, sure, they are risky. Uh, um, tests are getting bigger. They're getting more expensive. Uh, it's more failures can happen, and this is what we need to successfully manage now, that we get through these tests, that we can attempt the first flight, and I certainly believe we need a bit of luck as well. <laughs> yes, you always need a little bit of luck, especially when you're going into space for the first time. Do you, um, are there, I know most of the time you have to maintain the confidentiality of your customers, but do you have any customers that you can mention that you've picked up for your first flight or for subsequent flights? Yeah, we have close to around 10 degree agreements with uh, different customers. Um, some of them we announced already publicly. And for the first two flights with DLR, there's an announcement of opportunity ongoing right now. So that means institutional and commercial payloads can apply to use these three launches. It will end on the 15th of October for the first flights. So there's still ample of opportunity to anyone who's listening to actually tap into the game and use that free launch slot. So um, tell me about applications once again. I mean, you know, we, we've kind of, you know, small sets, this is a step up from small satellites. So what other kinds of unique applications could RFA be used for that, say, Electron can't or Skyrora's XL, for example, can't? You know, what sort of things will you be able to accomplish? Yeah, so with the 1.3 tons payload capacity to LEO, we can at the same time put around 500 kilograms directly to GTO. And that is actually very interesting for the small class of uh, geosatellites, which is now emerging. And with, we can also put 100 kilograms to the moon, 100 kilograms directly to geo. So there's lots of mission flexibility around that third stage that we have. And a lot of value to the customer on different flight profiles we can actually do. So... Um Again, just to another issue that I talk a lot about on my channel, I think this will probably be my final question, is um, in regards to space debris. Um, you know, I, last time I talked to you, there's the, that you're, first of all, you're not talking about reusability, at least not currently. Um, but do you have any plans with RFA to get engaged in the removal of space debris from LEO as that becomes a much bigger problem? So two things, on the recovery side, yes, our corsage is designed to be reusable. We just uh, need a recovery system that we will not use on the first flight, but it sets some sequently later, and actually to recover the core stage. For that, it might be interesting. And for um, orbital parameters, as you said, for debris, um, our third stage will do a active re-entry at the end of life. And uh, we are also looking at, can we actually use remaining delta V on that orbital stage to maybe take something with us? That would be our dream, right? Send something up take two things down, we are the, the cleaner of uh, the space environment. So you're going to deorbit the third stage and you're also 
you know, maybe going to use what's left in the fuel tanks to maybe haul something down. Is, is that what I hear you saying? Exactly. That's a dream. It's super hard and uh, very complex, but it would be amazing if we can achieve it. Fantastic. Is there anything else you would like the viewers to know about you know, RFA's plans and, and the splash that you're going to make here in the spaceflight world? Follow us on all the social media channels. There's lots of progress that we will show very, very soon and a few nice announcements. And there's real nice stage activity footage upcoming, so stay tuned. Well, I'm heading to Saks of Ord myself here in a few weeks, um, so I, I'm going to be doing my utmost to try to bring all the details of this fir first flight to you as much as I'm permitted to anyway. So I am very excited to be working with you folks in the future. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure, Jordan. Take care. So I'm recording this last part from the media section of the IAC convention floor area. They don't want me to make a lot of noise. I certainly can't blame them for that. But if this company can indeed accomplish everything they're talking about, 1.3 tons to SSO for only $5 million, that's going to make them a competitor very, very hard to match, even for SpaceX. So until every other launch provider is aiming to towards these kinds of objectives as well. I urge all of you to stay angry about space.